Well, yes, you do. That's right. <laughs> Better watch the damned. They're going to break their chains. And then they're coming to get you, you greasy fear mongers. All right. Anyway, welcome, folks. This is the Balls to the Walls program. Freaker's Ball will be next week, as it was last week. Because the Moose Girl this week is out at a concert, having a good old time. And we're here having a good old time. So let's have a good old time right here on Balls to the Wall. RealLibertyMedia.com on this Friday evening, March 15th, 2019. Beware the Ides of March, as they say. Or somebody said. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, we're live uh, tonight right here, and we're live not only on the video stream on the RealLibertyMedia.com page, on, on the show page for Freaker's Ball, but also on the audio stream that goes everywhere to all the various places out there, to RLMRadio.xyz, to uh, FreedomsNetwork.com, to RealLiberty.org, to Internet Radio, to TuneIn.com. Tomorrow it'll be up at other places, too. That's right. We'll be up on, on the Spreaker tomorrow. We'll be up on YouTube tomorrow. We'll be up on iHeartRadio tomorrow and on 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 uh, BitChute. <laughs> I remember that one. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, uh, it gets out there. But tonight, for live for live broadcast, it's the RLM radio stream and the Vaughn.live slash Real Liberty Media page there or the, the show page there on RealLibertyMedia.com. Oh. So, uh, welcome to everybody out here, out there, out here, in there, <laughs> that may be tuned in and listening. Uh, let me say hi to all the folks over here in the chat that I like to do, and uh, everybody else kind of has uh, glommed onto that concept, or maybe they just did it on their own. I don't know, but yeah, I come over here to the chat, and I say hi to everybody, because these are my peeps, these are the cool folk. We got the barman, we got me, we got the moose girl, although she's not here. We got Miss Kate, we got Asmo and Chalcedoni and Gramsy. Great show earlier, Grammy. Uh, we got uh, IB Don C X2. We got Mr. Meister Brabham, the woodman himself. We got Miss Rain and Mr. Rob Works in his high quality fancy bubbler. I tell you, man, Rob Works, he, he must have one hell of a weed budget for all the weed he's passed around here on the channel. I think some people can help him out on that. All right, we got Mr. Trust No One. We got the Vanna White Pot. Uh, yeah, she does all kinds of stuff. We got Mr. Vin E., who also did a interesting show earlier today. We got the weather dork, and uh, yeah, pretty much just tells the weather for you. Uh, we got Phantom and Beetle and Colfax and Cyborg and Noodle. We got the Dakota and D. Greaser, which I do believe is Mikey, but I uh, won't go any further than that. Uh, we got Frumpy and Gromit and Java Doctor 2. We got JJ's 999 uh, JJ's. Mr. Kozu and Kiss and Pwn sauce himself with the Sock Puppet Tech Man. And finally, the Uno Bot. Yes, all of the folks here in the RLM chat. If you're not in the RLM chat, by the way. Oh, by the way, we have other people listening in other places, other channels here on IRC. Yeah. Uh, hey, Chloe! <laughs> yeah, no, we got, we got other folks out there. Maybe you want a taco listening in. I don't know. Uh, we got we got other folks out there, though, that are tuned in and listening from other spots out there. Where was I going? I don't even know. I, I was going down a path, and I got distracted by the fact that there were more folks. Huh. I don't know. <laughs> oh, boy. So, anyway, yeah, yesterday, last night, not that this is important to anybody but me, but I'm going to tell you about it anyway, because... Uh, it is interesting to me, and not in a good way. Anyway, last night uh, I noticed that uh, my my heater, my central heat, that runs via this, uh, I have a wireless um, thermostat, and for some reason it wasn't coming on. And it, it hasn't come back on to this point in time. And it's been a little chilly here in the house. <laughs> so I looked through some old stuff and I and I and I and I uh, dug out a uh, this little so it's a little space heater just a little guy but um, let me tell you it cranks out some major heat anyway so I got that to heat this room 
um, which is really the only room I actually need heat in. All the other rooms I can I can deal with. Uh, but uh, anyway, I don't know what the deal is with with my thermostat. Like I said, it's a wireless uh, total line thing, and uh, so I, it's done this before, and then it would come back on. But this time it's not coming back on. So I started looking at uh, some thermostats out there today. They're not cheap, and and it's confusing too because there's so many different things that need to. I, I don't understand. I don't. I have to. I'm gonna have to look at the at the at the manual for the unit, for the the central heat air unit, and uh, see what the hell it is. But uh, it kind of sucks, man. It's a <laughs> like I said, they're not cheap. They 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 they, uh, they run anywhere from 100 to like 300, 400 dollars. Your freaking thermostat, and I'm not even sure it's the thermostat. I just know that the thing's not turning on, and I believe it to be the thermostat because I tried it on various other modes, uh, cooling mode and just fan mode and stuff like that. So, boo hoo me. <laughs> anyway, how y'all do it out there? Now that I've told you my story of woe for today, uh, yeah, how y'all doing? I hope y'all had a good week. And and uh, you're, you're going to have a, a good weekend coming up. And uh, let's see what's going on over here in the chat, because sometimes I like to check out the chat, see what's going on. Uh, it looks like here, uh, D. Greaser. Um, <laughs> uh, somebody stole, some, some neighborhood kid stole his eggs out of his chicken coop or whatever, wherever his chickens are today. That's a sad thing there. Yep, 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 yep. And let's see what else we got going on in here. Uh, da, 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 da. uh, people saving dogs that, uh, to rest, who, oh, a U.S. man defies firefighters. U.S. man? Huh, that's an interesting way to phrase it. U.S. man <laughs> defies firefighters, runs into the burning home to rescue the family pit bull. Well, good for that U.S. man. How do you know he's a U.S. man? <laughs> Oh, and then some slamming on CNN, which is always cool and fun. And uh, da, 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 da. hey, Vinny, Vinny, Vinny says hi. Uh, a, a toggle? What are you talking about, Vinny? <laughs> I don't know, man. But you, you can't really put a toggle on a, a central heat and air unit. Forty dollars at Home Depot says Kate. Okay, well I'll check that tomorrow. I, I didn't. Uh, I didn't look too deeply into it. I just looked and it was like, ah, I don't want to deal with this. <laughs> don't make me deal with this. <laughs> but apparently I'm going to have to one way or the other. And it's fine right now, actually, because, you know, we're basically at the end of winter, although it was 17 degrees this morning. Um, and so basically at the end of the winter, the beginning of uh, fall here, or uh, spring here, Fall, spring, whatever. Uh, yeah, so I got a little bit of leeway in here, hopefully, uh, especially with this little heater that if I need to, I can warm up this room. Um, so that that's cool. Uh, but we'll figure it out. <sighs> yeah. I, I, and I saw that on, as Kate says, $300 for a smart one that will program itself. It's just like, what? Um <laughs> So I, I have no interest in a smart one. I want one I could turn off and turn on, set to a temperature, and it and it cycles at that temperature. That's all I need. Kate says they're forty dollars at Home Depot. I'll check it out tomorrow, <laughs> and hopefully that's the right thing. Um, and I may have to run wires if it, you know. The, the, I don't know if I get another wireless one because they're all talking Wi-Fi ones now, and I, uh, this is not Wi-Fi. I think it's radio signal coming off this one. Um, so, whatever. I'm going to have to figure something out. I may have to go into the box out there and put it in a new receiver or just run wires and then I could drill some holes through the wall here and get that going. Uh, whatever, man. Uh, it's just something I have to deal with that I don't want to. <laughs> don't make me do things. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's how that works. Um, anyway, let's play some music. Uh, get this... Uh, balls to the wall uh, go in the right direction here starting in the right direction anyway yeah forty dollars at amazon says miss kate thank you very much for a non-programmable oh let me, let me cut, grab that link before i get to the music and uh, so i can bookmark that for later on 
is a yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, all right. It doesn't say it's wireless, so it may not be one heat, one cool. That's all I need. I only have a single, 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 single stage heater. So yeah, wired. Okay. Well, uh, I don't have any wires running out there right now. Um, <laughs> Never mind. I'm not even going to get into it, but <laughs> there was a situation when I first moved in, or about a year after I moved in, where I had to replace it, and rather than run wires, I got a wireless. So, um, yeah. Right. It's, it, it's not like that, Vinny. I, I got a wireless. It's not like that. I can't do that. All right. Anyway, we're going to play some music. <laughs> All right. Here we go. What's that? Oh, it has been a long time since I rock and rolled. Led Zeppelin, uh, 1973 there. Uh, yeah, before that, we had the Stones, the Rolling Stones, the Mick Jagger. It was a little promo video they did for the song. It's only rock and roll, but I like it. Yeah, you notice the trend there? Rock and roll, it's only rock and roll. And we kicked it off with Sammy Hagar doing heavy metal. <laughs> fun, fun stuff, let me say. Oh, boy. <laughs> I love music, man. I love rock and roll. I love rock and roll. All right, so, uh, yeah, I got a few uh, suggestions there during that set uh, from people there in the chat room uh, about uh, different uh, thermostat, thermostats, and uh, so apparently they got some for 40 bucks down at the Home Depot or even at, uh, at the Amazon uh, there on uh, that, so uh, I'll be looking into those tomorrow. I don't really need to worry too much about... Uh, I don't have to do it too quick, as long as I get it before it gets warm out, you know, because uh, I'm, I'm fine with the cool, the cold, whatever, but uh, not not uh, great on the heat, so uh, that, that, that's, that's where I draw the line. And let me just tell you, this little heater here <laughs> in this room, it, 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 I have to keep take, turning it down. It keeps uh, heating the room up to like 70 degrees. <laughs> I don't want it that warm in here, uh, so yeah. That's a, that's a, something else to look into. Yeah. Uh, all right, all right. Oh, what do we got here? Oh, I, I, I did not play any Aerosmith. Rob works is saying I drew the line, but yeah, no, I didn't play that song. <laughs> hey, quiet over there. All right. All right. There's that. There's that. There's that. There's that. Everything looks good there. Lines are meant to be erased. Well, sometimes they are. So, today, what did I say? Oh, yes, the Ides of March. And on Sunday is the, uh, ba -ba 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 -ba, what do you call it? St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> I don't really have any St. Patrick's songs lined up. Uh, we usually play something, you know, like uh, Dropkick Murphys or uh, other pseudo-Irish bands could be just the receiver got windblown. Now, well, that's highly possible, Kate. I didn't even think about that. Um, yeah, we had we had some wind here this week, let me tell you. Oh, we had wind, we had sideways rain coming in. We had, oh boy, it was it was it was, it was some wild, wild, weird, wild stuff, as Johnny Carson would say. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, let's kick it off with a with a with a story about global cooling. Global cooling? What the hell? <laughs> this is on uh, climatechangedispatch.com uh, by I, I, I suppose the guy's Indian. I don't know Vijay Vijay Jaraj 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 whatever. All right. Why the real climate threat is global cooling? That's right. There was a train blowing off the track here in uh, New Mexico. It was a, it was a, a long, I don't know, 26 cars or something like that. 
Uh, I, I do believe all those cars were empty, and I do believe they were double stacked, and they were going through a gorge uh, where the wind gusts tend to multiply themselves. So uh, I, it's understandable uh, in that kind of wind that we were getting. They're basically hurricane force winds uh, flying around. Um, so it's, it's understandable how that train could have been knocked off that track, but still quite the sight as we saw that. Yeah, exactly, uh, Rob. The sideways rain can, can get into some crazy places. I, I know, I know, I know. And, uh, so, uh, I'll, I'll probably look at, uh, you know, breaking, breaking down the, or uh, tearing the side off that case off the, off the unit, uh, this weekend if I, I uh, can't figure something out, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get it. We'll get it. No big deal. Uh, anyway, thank you all for the help, and I appreciate it. Anyway, so uh, climate alarmists, you know who they are. You've seen them. You've talked to them. Climate alarmists constantly warn us that man-made global warming is making our world less habitable, and that climate doomsday is fast approaching. Nonsense. <laughs> There's no such thing as man-made or anthropogenic, if you prefer, global warming. And uh, there is no doomsday approaching. But a closer look at our climate reveals a surprising climate discovery that the CLAP, or mainstream media, as they refer to it here, the corporate lame-ass propaganda, have conveniently ignored for decades. The sun! That big orange ball of fire in the sky that lights up your day every day. Yeah, that thing. That's the the primary driver of either global warming or global cooling. It's not your SUV, it's not the cow farts. It's 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 not your farts. <laughs> anyway, so so for the first time in, in humanity's history our leaders um, could be actively devising policies based on their defiant and biased obsession with global warming that will render us, you and I and everybody else, the other 7 billion odd folks around the planet, that will render us highly vulnerable to even the very slightest cooling in our climatic system. We are causing irreversible damage to our environment. We are headed for climate doomsday due to excessive warning. Climate change may wipe out humanity. These are our everyday headlines, and they are pure nonsense. Pure nonsense. As a climate scientist, I, I, I find these headlines, and not me, this guy Vijay, he's the climate scientist, uh, as a climate scientist, I find these headlines and the stories they introduce vague and full of hasty generalizations. The repeated one-dimensional doomsday cry about carbon dioxide's role in global temperature blinds the public to the real causes. It says here other causes, but I'm just going to say the real causes. Uh, CO2 is just one of many factors that influence global temperatures. And I'm going to go a little further than him and say... CO2 has absolutely zero effect on any temperature. CO2 is not a driver of global, global warming or climate change or climate disruption or whatever the hell they want to call it this week. <laughs> it, uh, its role in recent warming is far from dominant. Indeed, there is a poor correlation between CO2 emissions and global temperature. Between 2000 and 2018, global temperature showed no significant increase despite a steep increase in carbon dioxide emissions from humans, anthropogenic sources. That would include cows. Uh, the, the same was the case between 1940 and 1970 when carbon dioxide concentration uh, at a constant and steady rate, and temperatures don't follow the pattern. We can be certain that the carbon dioxide is not the primary driver or even a minimal driver of global temperature. But if not CO2, then what? Life on Earth is possible because of Earth's perfect positioning in this solar system. 
not too close to the sun, not too far. The Goldilocks zone, if you will. For centuries, academians have acknowledged this, and climate scientists today know that the sun is absolutely the biggest influencer and driver of global temperature. NASA's page on solar influence clearly states that. Their page states it. They don't state it. They lie about everything. <laughs> anyway, um, anyway, their, their page state clearly states that the sun largely determines Earth's atmospheric and surface temperatures. Astrophysicists, astrophysicists and climatologists measure these changes in the sun in terms of quantifiable phenomenon such as sunspot, sunspot activity and solar cycles. However, in recent times, the liars at NASA have succumbed to the pressure from the climate doomsday proponents. NASA's original page on the sun's impact on our climate system is now hidden from the public domain. With the advent of dangerous man-made global warming theory, CO2 has taken the limelight. And do you know why CO2 has taken the limelight? Because they can blame you for that. And that's the only reason. They can blame you, they can tax you, they can control you. That's why CO2 is taking the limelight. And the sun has been relegated to a mere spectator. Oh, Rooms, uh, pretty much every article I read is a tongue twister to me. I, I, I stumble over things. <laughs> anyway, this could be the warming, obsessed, alarmist, biggest mistake ever. But they love it. In Central Europe, for example, temperature changes since 1990 coincided more with the changes in our solar activity than with atmospheric CO2 concentration. The same has been true globally across centuries. The Maunder Minimum of 1645 through 1715 and the Dalton Minimum of 1790 through 1830, periods of low solar activity, were responsible for the coldest periods of the Little Ice Age. England's River Thames froze. A whole civilization collapsed and people starved because cold-induced poor harvests led to malnutrition that made people too weak to resist disease. Likewise, solar activity in the Roman Warm Period, to, uh, 250 B.C. approximately to A.D. 400, the, and Medieval Warm Period, 950 A.D. to 1250, brought warmer temperatures on Earth and thriving crops led to greater nutrition and lower mortality rates. Hundreds of peer-reviewed scientific papers affirm the overwhelming impact of solar activity on Earth's temperature. But the question is, will there be cooling? Observations of sunspot activity at Space Weather Prediction Center and the National Ocean Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, indicate that there has been a lull in solar activity over the past 18 years, the same period during which there has been no significant warming, confirming an absolute direct correlation between solar activity and global average temperature. <laughs> Some scientists say, climate scientists say, Another major cooling is likely soon. Their claims are not outlandish. Anyway, you, you guys know all this, I think. I mean, I, I, I've talked about it for a long time. And, um, and and I'll probably keep talking about it because it's it's one of my, my big uh, points of conflict with the, with the scientific community. I, I mean, I personally, I, I love science, but... What they're doing with, with the climate information is not science. It's absolute bunk. You don't, you don't take the numbers you get and then modify them to get the results you want and call that science. That is freaking crap. <laughs> that's what that is. But that's what they're doing. And you also never say the science is settled. But indeed, they have said and repeated many, many times that the science is settled. And if you don't believe the science is settled, there's something wrong with you. 
You're you're a denier. Well, yeah, I'm a denier because you're lying. If you weren't lying, I probably wouldn't be a denier. <laughs> yeah, Rob, I, I was I was kind of looking to a little bit of global war, forward to a little global warming myself. And we know those those guys up in uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin and uh, North Dakota, boy, they they really want some global warming up there, but they ain't getting it. Sorry, guys. Uh, you're going to have to rough it out, tough it out, or move out, as uh, may, Moose Girl may be doing sometime in the near future. We don't know. Um, but, uh, <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> it's always so fun. <laughs> uh, but but they keep on. They keep on. And, and they call you crazy if you disagree with their lies. That's right. Cold is warm. Up is down. War is peace. It is 1984. This is the new speak of this, this time period. Now, they were looking here uh, in the uh, New Mexico. That's where I live, New Mexico. Uh, they were looking here in the uh, state, whatever, con Congress and Senate, the House and the Senate, the Congress, the New Mexico Congress, to legalize marijuana in New Mexico. And they came up with a bill that I talked about, oh, I think Monday this week, might have been. Uh, they, they, were, they were talking about a bill that was just horrendous. It was horrible. It was horrible. Now, I don't know if anything got through or not, but according to the article that I found yesterday, the state bill to create state-run pot shops appears dead. And I cheered that. I mean, I've always wanted weed to be not a... Uh, considered to be a criminal thing. Uh, I, I, I don't want it to be considered anything by the government, I don't, any more than uh, a dandelion growing in your yard. That's all it should ever be considered. But, no, that's not the way they think of it. So I have always wanted to be able to have the freedom to have and grow and possess whatever, uh, use whatever whatever type of weed that I wanted to. Since I was young, since I was a very young man, and uh, even you know, even even uh, early teen years and and forward, because it's weed, and I I like it. A lot of people like it. Millions and millions and millions, hundreds of millions of people like marijuana, cannabis, call it what you will, weed, dope. <laughs> I actually I, I actually prefer the term dope, uh, but that's you know that's just me. Anyway. But so anyway, it appears that this bill is dead, uh, according to what I see here uh, in this article from KOAT.com. It says here that a proposal making New Mexico the first U.S. state to set up its own government-operated marijuana stores appears dead. And why do I cheer this, that, hooray, it's not going to be legalized in New Mexico? Very simply... Because if this one doesn't go through, maybe there's a chance they'll actually make one that's decent uh, in the next go-around. I, I don't know for sure, but hopefully they will. Anyway, the House bill, uh, the House passed bill that would legalize marijuana in New Mexico remains stuck in the Senate Finance Committee. And it doesn't appear that chairs, whoever, uh, plan to give it a hearing. Uh, Senator John Sapien a Bernalillo Democrat, Bernalillo is where Albuquerque is, Bernalillo County, uh, Democrat, says the proposal likely is dead this session because lawmakers still have questions with only hours left. Sapien says some private companies and medical marijuana providers have concerns over how the bill is written. Thankfully, <laughs> some of the minor details, and they're not in this article about that, but some of the minor details of how they wanted to run their state-run stores and state-run dispensaries, and they wanted to make sure that if you were possessing marijuana in this state, that you had the receipt from one of their state-run stores, or else it would be a criminal thing. <laughs> Absolute nonsense. And no, no growing of your own weed unless you were a medical marijuana person, not, not a... Uh, recreational type person or a non-medical person which really it's stupid because everybody that, that, that smokes weed 
is is getting medical benefit from it, whether they realize it or not. Anyway, so hooray for the non not not legalizing of marijuana in New Mexico. I know that kind of sounds a little strange coming from me, but there it is. <laughs> I want no part of it. Not that. Not that. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. Let's just play some more music. I'm going to play some more music. <laughs> all right. Where are we at here? All right. Where, 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 where's, where's, my, where's, my, where's my camera? Got to find my camera. I call it a camera. It's not really a camera. It's all right. This is uh, a uh, Chloe request here. Joe Bonamassa and Larkin Poe doing Cream's Spoonful. Yipper. Ah, oh, yes, just a shadow away, children. Absolutely. <laughs> that was not the Rolling Stones, by the way, in case you were wondering. That was Grand Funk Railroad covering. The Stones give me shelter. Uh, before that, live from Daryl's house, Booker T and some other folk, not the MGs there, uh, doing were green onions. Which, by the way, if I'm going to ever consume onions, it's going to be that song. It's not going to be any actual onions. But I love that song, Green Onions, by uh, Booker T and the MGs, but... Again, that was not the MGs there with him. And we kicked it off again with the uh, Chloe request. Joe Bonamassa and Larkin Poe, do it, Larkin Poe doing a spoonful at the Keeping the Blues Alive at Sea Cruise. Yeah, so many so many great videos came out of that, that concert. We played some last week. And we'll probably be playing some more. Maybe this week, maybe next week. Who knows? Whatever. Whenever. A lot of, a lot of great videos coming there. And actually... The douchebag, Paul Schaefer, was there in that video, but he was actually playing the keyboards. So he was adding a little something uh, to the whole thing, which is weird for him because he's just useless. <laughs> he really is just useless. But, yeah, it was good to see him uh, actually uh, adding something to the song rather than just standing around making a goof of himself. Because, yeah... The hell with that guy. Anyway, <laughs> not that there, not that anybody else in the world that plays keyboards could have probably done that job, do, did that just as well. Uh, but you know, eh, is what it is. So I hope I hope Moose Girl, by the way, speaking of Moose Girl, uh, is out there having a great time at what her show. Quiet, you. Uh, it, <laughs> Having a great time at her show that she's at this evening. Um, and I guess over the weekend, I guess she's got uh, other places to go. That she, It's not all going to be done at one place, her her whole thing. Um, yeah, well, you know, whatever. That's cool. Yep, 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 yep. Always got to do those festivals. It's festival good afternoon. Season. No, not good afternoon. It's not afternoon. Quiet, you. Sometimes these videos will play a second or two uh, before they stop. They're supposed to automatically not play. But I, I, I have this plug-in that's supposed to stop them from playing automatically. But yeah, they throw me a second or two before they stop on their own. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, by the way, Larkin Poe. Let me just speak about Larkin Poe here for a moment. Not, not that it's anything important. Just my view, my opinion. A couple of years ago, the first time I saw a Larkin Poe video, because they were popping up all over the place. Anyway, I watched one on the YouTube there. And I was like, eh, whatever. These girls, they, they're not really doing anything impressive to me. They're not anything special. And then once I watched one Larkin Poe video, my YouTube recommends filled up with all kinds of Larkin Poe crap. So I watched a few more. And I still, I just was not as like, these girls, they're just... They're okay, they're not, but they have really developed over the last couple of years. And they, I would say they are are very fine artists at this point in time. So, uh, they're sisters, those two. 
Uh, I don't I don't know their actual names offhand, but uh, as far as I do know, they are sisters. So, yeah. All right, let's talk about your 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 not mine, your U.S. military <laughs> and their war on everybody. Uh, this article posted today on theantimedia.com via Zero Hedge and Tyler Durden. U.S. warplanes accidentally obliterate Allied allied friends friends afghan military base yeah they did it says here in the latest bizarre story and i only wish it was a bizarre story but it's kind of run-of-the-mill story at this point but the latest bizarre story to come out of the united states endless endless ever ongoing war in afghanistan it's, what, uh, 16 years now, something like that? 17, 18, 18 years. 18 years now. All right, uh, American warplanes obliterated an allied Afghan... No, 17, 18 years. Excuse me, it's, it's not important. You know, it's a long time. Um, American warplanes obliterated an allied Afghan military post in act of self-defense, quote, quote. What? Self-defense? They're your allies. Uh, yesterday, uh, Wednesday, uh, the incident took place in the tribal Urgs, Aruzgan <laughs> province of South Central Afghanistan and reportedly began when a joint convoy of U.S. troops and Afghan special forces came under fire by another unit of Afghan ground troops in what appears a major instance of accidental friendly fire. Wait, wait. Uh, if I die I'm being shot, you really call that friendly fire? I'm going to say no. Anyway, resulting in a devastating two dozen total casualties on the Afghan side. The incident is under investigation. Yeah, they're investigating themselves. Uh, but U.S. mission spokesman uh, Paul Perdeman appeared to excuse U.S. actions, well, of course, in a statement uh, yesterday. We are operating in a complex environment where enemy fighters do not wear uniforms and stolen military vehicles and do use stolen military vehicles to attack government forces, he said. <laughs> oh, American forces indicate they came under attack by an unknown entity. U.S. planes flying overhead, then destroyed the Afghan army post, uh, described by the Pentagon as a checkpoint, which killed at least six soldiers and wounded nine others at a small base, which housed a total of 17. So it's pretty much complete there. They got uh, uh, nine, 15 out of the 17 were either hurt, dead, or, or injured. Um, the U.S. side reported no deaths or injuries, and that's kind of like you could always watch these reports on your local news or whatever uh, talking about nasty shit cops did to somebody or some group of people. And, the, and they, uh, they always throw in there, no cops were injured in this event. Well, duh. <laughs> uh, anyway, they will not release the information about that until the full investigation of themselves into themselves is concluded. Uh, the U.S. Department of Defense confirmed the incident on Wednesday, which it described as a mistaken, mistaken example of the fog of war. Uh, Pentagon spokesman Sergeant First Class Deborah Richardson told the New York Times the U.S. conducted a precision self-defense airstrike. R precision? They were they were shooting at themselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, real precision there, guys. Um, <laughs> airstrike on people who were firing at partnered U.S. Afghan force. Ironically, U.S. officials described the aerial bombing of the Allied Afghan post as a precision airstrike per the AP. 
the soldiers were killed by friendly fire. So it wasn't bad. It was friendly. It was nice. It was good. Oh, it was all good. It was friendly fire. Yeah. In what was supposed to be a precision airstrike by U.S. forces supporting Afghan soldiers battling insurgents near the town of Karen Kot in the Uruzgan province. It was the second, second major incident to cause Afghan casualties following a prior fight with the Taliban. For the second time in a few days, the Afghan army base was destroyed on Wednesday. But this time by an American airstrike that followed a firefight between the Afghans and Americans. Uh, last year, the Pentagon acknowledged, actually admitted, the war in Afghanistan is costing you, the American taxpayer, $45 billion a year, with a number of public studies putting the total figure at over $1 trillion since the war was began nearly two decades ago. The endless war has become more expensive in current dollars, you see, dollars back in 2001, were we're we're less expensive than they are today, but uh, <laughs> yeah. it's not funny. But what are you gonna do? But laugh? I I don't know. Uh, anyway, the the endless war has become more expensive in current dollars than the Marshall Plan, which was the total reconstruction effort to rebuild Europe after World War Two. So back then, when they 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 destroyed an entire continent, basically. It costs less to rebuild that whole thing than it's cost to destroy this place that was basically, you know, a third world piece of dirt in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, you're doing a great job over there, boys. Killing off your friends and allies. Doing a terrific job. But that 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 is what it is. Uh, that is what it is. Uh, and speaking of uh, blowing shit up, the United States military, the Department of Defense, the Pentagon, whatever you want to call them, they all love blowing shit up. People, countries, they don't care. This article on theantimedia.com as well, posted by Jason Ditz, top U.S. general supports preemptive nuclear first strike. Yeah. With the world's most destructive arsenal, largest and most destructive arsenal of nuclear weapons, the United States poses an enormous risk, not just to peace, but to survival of much of the human race. That's only a problem, of course. If the U.S. starts using that arsenal... And they are chomping at the bit to do so. You freaking bet they are. Which is where formal U.S. nuclear doctrine would come in. There have been debates for decades on whether the United States should adopt a no-first-use policy, officially ruling out the idea that the United States would launch a nuclear attack without first being attacked with a nuclear weapon. Morally, this ought to be obvious. But every attempt to adopt such a policy has been opposed, with Joint Chiefs Commander General John Joe Dunford, the latest to come out against the idea, saying, promising not to nuke other nations in a first strike would simplify an adversary's decision-making. Really? <laughs> just, just take a look at your your nuclear arsenal compared to theirs, and tell me how that simplifies their decision-making. Dunford uh, went on to argue that there are a few situations where he believes the president should retain the option to launch nuclear first strikes, though he did not say what those situations were. Uh, yeah, he's, gotta, he's, he's down in the polls or whatever. Uh, th those kind of things, yeah. Uh, so uh, when, if, if that kind of thing happens, go ahead and nuke somebody. You'll be right back top of the polls, buddy. All right, given the potential disastrous consequences of such a strike, it's unsurprising that many in Congress are pushing to limit the risk of the president being able to do that unilaterally. Uh, this is so annoying. 
so annoying. I, I, I don't even I don't even know what you could do about it. Um, yeah, I, I don't even know. Well, I mean, you can protest all you want, but they're gonna uh, they they got the bombs and they got the buttons and and they're crazy. They're crazy motherfuckers. <laughs> So I don't know what to do. I really, I, I, I really don't. Um, uh, all right, I'll save this. I, 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 I can't. I, I came across this this one post earlier today because I, I went out looking for it because somebody was talking about voting over there on the Twitter and and asking if. If you oppose voting for party A or party B or whatever, I forget what it was. They, whatever they were, they were in favor of voting, obviously. And uh, so I, I went over there and I found it. So, um, yeah. <laughs> oh boy. Anyway, we're gonna play some more music right now for you all. Yeah. Uh, you heard a chicken foot? Chicken foot. If you have it, you go, you're about to. <laughs> ah, yeah, very nice, very nice there. The Tedeschi Trucks Band, TTB, uh, doing the old box tops tune, The Ladder. Uh, let's see if it says where that concert was at here. Uh, bah, bah, bah. Um, <laughs> uh, well, they, they didn't mention the box tops here. They mentioned Joe Cocker because he also did that. Uh, but, but they don't say, uh, let's see. Oh, it's the Lockin', Lockin' Festival on September 11, 2015. So uh, yeah, that's 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 a box top song, but uh, yeah, Cocker also did it. All right, before that we had a Mr. Vincent Easley request, uh, Haley Reinhardt with the v vintage postmodern jukebox doing Radiohead's "Creep," and we kicked it off with Chicken Foot. Yes, indeed, a great band uh, doing Deep Purple's "Highway Star." So all, all three were covers there on that particular uh, set. So uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, uh, I dig that stuff. So remember, I told you, you know, you would know who Chicken Foot was after that, which hopefully uh, you you now know who Chicken Foot is. Yes, you are a creep and a weirdo, uh, Mr. Vincent. But I wasn't even going to mention that. You brought it up on your own. So, <laughs> but yeah, Chicken Foot. For those of you unaware, uh, Sammy Hagar. Uh, and Michael Anthony from Van Halen as well. Uh, Joe Satriani on the guitar. Awesome, awesome. And uh, Chad Smith of the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Except I think that might have been uh, Kenny Aronoff, also a, a Chili Pepper man. Uh, no, not. Oh, wait, what? Yeah, I think he was too. Um, <laughs> I'm not positive on that. Don't quote me. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Chicken Foot was great there for, you know, the, the little time that they did together. But uh, yeah, you know, these 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 guys get together and they do some stuff and it's awesome and then they go away. So eh, you know, what you gonna do? What you gonna do? You gonna you gonna listen to the music they gave you and and see where they go next and and hopefully that band that they put together is good as well. Hey, be quiet over there. Your videos starting on me. <laughs> Oh uh, man! <laughs> All right. Okay. So let me see if I can find this tweet that I that I came across because somebody responded to me uh, on it, and they they didn't like the fact that I was against voting. Um. <laughs> oh, here it is. Oh, so so uh, yeah. Uh, see if I can find the actual whole thing here. Oh, the original tweet is no longer available. Um. But but somebody had asked something about voting. Uh, would you oppose voting if it was this group or that group? And I wrote back, I oppose voting in general. Voting is violence. And uh, I linked to them an article from forjustice.org. Uh, and then some, some, some status wrote back to me 
NAP, one of those. <laughs> and laughed, laughed their ass off. Um, so, so anyway, the uh, article that I linked there in that particular uh, tweet, reply tweet, uh, was this one from 1999 by a guy named Hans, believe it or not. Hans Scherer uh, on ForJustice.org. Voting is an act of violence. That's right. Voting is the most violent act someone can commit in their lifetime. This little noted anomaly about voting is direct, directly related to the modern conception of the state as an entity deriving its grant of authority to act from the consent of the governed. Consent. Yes. The aura of legitimacy surrounding the government's action is enhanced by the perceived role of voting as an expression of the people's will. Wrong em, boyo. Uh, whether non-threatening or violent, the authority for each and every one of the government's actions is presumed to flow from the consent of the people through the electoral process. School children are told this from their earliest years. The idea the state derives its power to act from the consent of the people sounds romantic. Few people, however, are aware that by definition the state's power is for the specific purpose of engaging in acts of violence. That's what the state's power is. It is to engage in the acts of violence. No grant of power is necessary for anyone or any organization to act peacefully. There is no secret among scholars, uh, and sociologist Max Weber's definition of the state is considered one of the most authoritative. A state is a human institution that claims the monopoly of legitimate use of physical force within a given territory. The state is considered the sole source of the right to use violence. And you're voting for them. The legitimizing impact of voting on the government's exercise of power intimately involves voters in the use of that power, which means that non-voters tend to delegitimize the exercise of government's power as an expression of the will of people, so if no one voted in an election, or only a small percentage of the people did, the government could not profess to be empowered to act as an agent of the people's will. Without the protective cover provided by voters, the government would have no pretense to act except as law unto itself. Consequently, the government's actions and the voters who legitimize them are linked together. Thus, at a minimum, voters are spiritually involved in every act engaged by the government, including all violent acts, their sole purpose. The involvement in government's violence isn't tempered by nominal peacefulness of a person's life apart from voting. By choosing to vote, a person integrates violence engaged by the government as a part of their life. This is just as true of people that didn't vote for a candidate who supports a particular policy they may disagree with, as it is for those that did. It is going through the motion of voting itself that legitimizes government to act in their name, not who or what they vote for. This means that the violence perpetrated by any one person pales in the scope or significance when compared to that which is authorized to be taken by government in the names of those who vote. The combined ghoulish violence of every identifiable serial killer in America, uh, American history cannot match the violence of even one member of uh, or one, any of, <laughs> of even one of any number of violent acts taken by the government as the people's representative. A prominent example of this economics of the economic sanctions imposed on Iraq after the Gulf War in 1991. 
These sanctions prevented Iraq from rebuilding its destroyed sanitation, water, electric, power, uh, uh, infrastructure that were specifically targeted by the U.S. military for destruction. Supported by and enforced by the United States, these sanctions are credited by UNICEF and other organizations with contributing to the gruesome deaths of an estimated 3,000 to 5,000 children every month for over eight and a half years. All voters share in the government's contribution to the unnecessary deaths of these children caused by disease and reduced standard of living. So over half a billion deaths of innocent children in Iraq in the years after 1991's Gulf War are the, on the blood-stained hands of every single voter in the United States. The same dynamic of voter involvement in government atrocities is true of many hundreds of civilian deaths caused by the bombing of Yugoslavian cities in the spring and summer of 1999 that the United States participated in. This was a small-scale recreation of atomic bombing of the uh, non-military cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. Hundreds of thousands of innocent women, children, and old people were killed from the initial bomb blasts and the long-term effects of the radiation exposure. Those bombings had been preceded by the United States military's killing of many hundreds of thousands of non-combatants during the fire bombings of Tokyo, Hamburg, Dresden, and Berlin. All of those people killed uh, were killed in the name of the voters that had, had elected the Roosevelt administration in 1944 by a landslide. Voting is like a missile fired at an unseen target many miles away. It is a long-distance method of cleanly participating in the most horrific violence imaginable. So, declining to vote does much more than cause a statistical entry on the non-voting side of the ledger sheet. It is a positive way for a person to lower their level of moral responsibility for acts of violence engaged in by the government that they would never engage in personally, and that they don't want to be committed in their name as a voter. Non-voting is a positive way for a person to publicly express the depth of their private belief in respecting the sanctity of life, and the violence is only justified in self-defense. The social sphere in which most people live is notable for the level of peaceful cooperation that normally prevails in it. The majority of people strive to better their lives by working together with other people in the pursuit of their mutual self-interest. This community spirit of nonviolent cooperation supported by non-voting stands in sharp contrast to the societal violence endorsed by the act of voting. There you have it. Anybody that wants to say that, oh, I'm just voting, I'm not hurting anybody, yeah, you are. <laughs> yeah, you are. Anyway, here's a link to that. That link will also be in the uh, in the post-show blog tomorrow. Um, I don't know what they're talking about here. Ha Hansel says he likes violence because they smell nice. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh, -huh. uh, -huh. uh -huh. funny. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> Rome says, elect me, I will ban all voting. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good day, Rome. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, you know, when you go out there and you vote, just remember, just remember what you're doing. Just remember what, what you're endorsing. You're endorsing the government, and you know what the government does. They do all kinds of nasty things to people. Everywhere. And Hans, he, being the, the statist that he is, although he he rejects the, 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 the term statist for himself, he also rejects the term socialist for himself, but we, we're not going to get into all that. But he says, non-voting is a way to end up on your knees begging for another scrap of food from the master's table. And that, that is such brainwashed programming. I, 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 I can't even wrap my brain around the... <laughs> The, the way that he thinks to come up with a statement such as that. 
Uh, as Rob Works points out quite rightfully, yeah, because nobody who votes ever way ends up that way. <laughs> oh, you freaking voters. <laughs> so, if you don't think you're a socialist, but yet you support Trump, maybe this will get you a little bit. Maybe this will... Probably not. I, I mean, the true Trumpers, they, they can't be. They they can't be reasoned with. They can't be argued with. They they anything Trump does is just a freaking okay. But here it is for those of you that are also possibly think of yourself as a fiscal conservative, and yet you support Trump. Not that this has anything to do with reality. Not that his budget will ever actually do anything, go anywhere. But this is his proposal regardless. So that's beside the point. This is what he wants to do. From Reason.com, Trump's budget effectively guarantees trillion-dollar deficits until 2030. Once you get past the rosy economic expectations, the uh, phony economic, economic expectations, expectations, it's clear that Trump's budget is not a serious effort at fiscal restraint. Uh, quite the opposite, I would say there, uh, Mr. Eric Boehm uh, that wrote this article. Officially, President Trump's proposed budget would add an estimated $7.9 trillion to the national debt over the next 10 years even as annual deficits are projected to decline after hitting $1.1 trillion in 2020. But, as this guy wrote earlier this week, the White House official projections for the future deficits are predicated on some suspiciously generous estimates about future economic growth. Most economists, like those at the Federal Reserve, expect, expect the United States economy to grow at about 2% annually for the next decade. But the Trump budget projects 3% growth. That sounds like a small difference, but one that inflates future federal government revenue uh, by 9% over 10 years, which makes the budget a clear appear closer to being balanced than it actually is. A more conservative estimate of future growth revenue or future revenue growth is offered by the CBO Congressional Budget Office, which expects just 1.8% growth on average over the next decade, while the CBO has not yet issued an official assessment of Trump's budget plan. The fiscal hawks as the, at the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget, CRFB, have, have taken the CBO's growth projections and applied them to Trump's budget. The new result, trillion-dollar deficits, as far as the eye can see. Uh, and Hans points out, we already have a trillion dollar deficit. So sure, why not triple that? <laughs> 2030, that's about 11 years away. So at least double it. Um, <laughs> you know. And that's if nothing else comes up along the way that, that they decide they, they need to uh, spend more money on which, of course, it will, and they will, and yeah. So, there you go. And, and, and you know, as you present yourself there, uh, Jay Dredd, semi-libertarian in, in certain aspects, you should like uh, some of the articles there on reason. Although, semi-libertarian, which means they're also semi-statist, but whatever, whatever. There it is. <laughs> oh, and as Vinny points out, Trump is obvious all about Trump. Pretty much. <laughs> all right, we're going back to the music here. <laughs> those are those are some some longer uh, stories. Eh, maybe not. Whatever. We're going to, we're going to music one way or the other. Either way, because I want to and I'm going to. <laughs> All right, we're going to kick it off with one of my favorite artists here, Mr. Gary Hoey.
Oh, very nice there. Carlos Santana doing evil ways. Um, who's that guy on the vocals? I, 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 I know I know who that is, but... Uh, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, that was at the, the Las Vegas House of Blues. I've been there uh, in 2016. I wasn't there in 2016. That's when the song was recorded. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I was there with uh, Miss Kate, actually. Uh, before that was the Dead Daisies and a long way to go. And we kicked it off with Gary Howey doing Deja Blues at Don O'Dell's Legends. So, oh, yeah. Good stuff, man. Uh, uh, just, 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 just good rock and roll, I say. Yipper, yipper, yipper. Oh, anybody got any good plans for the weekend coming up here? I don't I don't really have any plans other than trying to get my damn heater thing fixed. <laughs> Which hopefully I will. Hopefully, hopefully it won't be that big of a deal. Uh, and I may have to wait for parts, you know. Uh, there's, there's that factor. We'll see. We'll see what goes on with all that nonsense. But, uh, yeah, I don't really have any uh, big plans coming up for the weekend. So, we'll check it out, though. What a time we got here. All right. All right. Yep, 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 yep. So, uh, anyway, um, 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 tomorrow, I can mention this now while I'm doing what I'm doing here. I could do two things at once, but I can't do three. Well, sometimes I can. Uh, anyway, <laughs> tomorrow you got uh, uh, Flash at the dork table, and possibly Grammy Mary sitting in with him. We'll see. We'll see how that goes. Uh, and, then, and then on Sunday you got me playing the blues here on the RLM radio. Plus we'll be playing the trivia here in the chat. So blues and trivia Sunday at noon Eastern, and uh, that that runs through like three, a little over three hours. And then, then we'll run right on into hell and see behind the woodshed opening up the big old can of whoop-ass. I'll be back again Monday evening with the Grim Leftovers program. Covering stories I didn't get to on this show. And then on Tuesday you got more Flash uh, in a perfect world. Possibly with Vinny. I don't know. It's a, that, That's going to depend on what Vinny's up to on that day, I suppose. And, um, bu 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 bu. yep, Wednesday is, is back to Grammy again, so... Check the schedule. It's up there. Everything's up there. It's all cool. Everything's good. Um. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Sandy Hoax. Uh, I mean, Hook. Wait. No, I was right the first time. Sandy Hoax. Those people are still going after it. Uh, Sandy Hook Massacre. Court rules it's okay to sue the gunmaker. Huh. Weird. So, you know, there's been a lot of, um, there's, there's, there's been a, a lot of people driving vehicles in the crowds of people and killing people. Not a lot, but there's been several occurrences. Uh, where people have taken a vehicle and driven it into crowds of people and killed a bunch of people. So can you sue the auto manufacturer for that? I don't think so. Do you think they're going to, some judge is going to allow the, the, the people to sue the auto manufacturer because somebody drove a vehicle into them? Where's the difference? I don't get it. Anyway, in a landmark ruling on Thursday, Connecticut's top court has given the go-ahead to a lawsuit by the victims of the Sandy Hook school shooting, which blames the manufacturer of the AR-15 style rifle used in the massacre. At least that's their story, and they're sticking to it. The Connecticut State Supreme Court narrowly overturned the 2016 decision of a lower court that threw out the lawsuit arguing that the defendant's arms manufacturer, Remington, and the distributors of the rifle are exempted from responsibility under the Protection of Lawful Commerce in Arms Act, the PLCAA, passed by Congress in 2005, 
relieves weapons manufacturers from liability in gun violence crimes. While the court on Thursday reaffirmed the gun maker enjoys protection under the act, it ruled that the plaintiff's family, those of the nine victims of the massacre and a teacher who survived the bloodshed, are entitled to sue the companies for alleged violation of marketing rules. The <laughs> so I see car commercials all the time. Shouldn't I be able to sue those car companies? I mean, the, the lawsuit argues that Remington violated the Connecticut Unfair Trade Practices Act, the CUTPA, uh, when it aggressively promoted its anti-semi-automatic, anti-automatic, and its semi-automatic Bushmash, Bushmaster XM15-E2S rifles to civilians. Civilians. You hear that word? Civilians. The plaintiffs took particular issue with Remington's marketing of high-capacity magazines. The issue was thrust back into the center of national gun control debate after the 2017 Las Vegas mass shooting. Why? Was that guy using an AR-15? I don't think so. <laughs> anyway, last month, a bill to outlaw the high-capacity magazines typically defined as magazines that are able to hold more than 10 rounds. 10 rounds is high capacity, apparently. Anti-Semite automatic. Very nice there, Woodman. Um, <laughs> anyway, so that, that, that uh, thing was reintroduced in Congress. However, in Connecticut and several other states, they have been banned since April 2013. It is a felony in Connecticut to possess these type of magazines if obtained after that date. So it was already a felony? The, the, the lawsuit points out that even before the Sandy Hoax tragedy in 2012, the AR-15 style rifle was notorious as a symbol of mass shootings. Only because certain people wanted it that way. Assault rifles, they call it an assault rifle. It's not an assault rifle. It's just a rifle. Assault rifles like Bushmaster XM15 E2S had been used to kill in department stores. What? And fast food chains. They killed in department stores? I don't remember those. At offices and homecoming parties, on courthouse steps, and in schools. It states accusing Remington and its co defendants of turning a blind eye to the unreasonable risks associated with selling rifles under these circumstances. Oh, it's all such nonsense. I can't even go on with it. But uh, you can, because I'm going to give you the link. <laughs> and you can read more of this nonsense. Of course, if you mention the words, or, or the, the term Sandy Hoax, and you post it somewhere, then, then you'll be labeled something bad and blackballed and called all kinds of nasty names and people will treat you as if you, you're you a climate denier. What? What? Climate denier? I don't deny there's a climate. <laughs> what kind of stuff is that? Oh, boy. <laughs> but speaking of climate deniers... Uh, this, this is this is this is this this is a little. It, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy that this would be something that these people are doing. Those poor children would be doing, and being promoted for, and being pushed down your throat. Now it's not just for the children. It's the children telling you what you should do, how you should live your life, what the science is. 16-year-old climate activist Greta Thunberg nominated for Nobel Peace Prize. What? 16-year-old? How could this be? <laughs> Swedish environmental activist Greta Thunberg, 16, was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize on Wednesday for her tireless work combating global warming. 
Oh, Woodman asked what happened to Hog, David Hogg. Uh, I'm sure you haven't heard the last of him. <laughs> so this 16-year-old girl is getting a Nobel Prize for her tireless, or nominated for a Nobel Prize. She's not getting it yet. Yet. Tireless work combating global warming. So you're combating something that doesn't exist. Hoo-hoo! We have proposed, Greta Thunberg, because if we do nothing to halt climate change, it will be the cause of wars, conflicts, and refugees. Really? <laughs> Norwegian lawmaker Freddy Andre Alstegard told the Norwegian news outlet VG, Greta Thunberg has launched a mass movement, which I see as a major contribution to peace over something fake. <laughs> After Sweden had its hottest summer on record, at least according to their fake records, uh, Thunberg went on strike in August to force politicians to act. She's 16. What do you mean she went on strike? Uh, since has She has since inspired hundreds of thousands to do the same, creating the Fridays for Future movement, which has enlisted thousands of young people to skip school this Friday today. Of course, you didn't get to hear about that because of that stuff going on down in New Zealand. You didn't get to hear about these kids walking out of school, which you can pretty much get kids to walk out of school for any cause whatsoever. It wouldn't matter what it was. Uh, no no bra Friday. <laughs> Thunberg spoke at the United Nations Climate Change Conference in Poland this past December, where she told... Oh, uh, lawmakers, they were not mature enough to tell it like it is. There you go. 16-year-old telling the lawmakers, you're not mature enough to tell tell the truth. The teen activist also spoke at the World Economic Forum in Davos, uh, Switzerland, in January. Honored and very grateful this, for this nomination, Thunberg tweeted. <laughs> Just take a look at a picture of her. She looks like, just like a little girl. Like, a, you know, she she could be 12 uh, as far as this picture looks to me. I, I don't know, but well, whatever, man. It's, it's craziness. It's absolute nonsense. You're now going to have children uh, set, setting global policy. Children, because that's the way they want it. Not because it's right or it's true. It's because that's the way they want it. Oh, you're saying bad things about this child? What's wrong with you, you monster? Yeah, I'm saying bad things about this child, but not necessarily because that. It's because you're listening to her. You're paying attention to her. <laughs> because she supports your cause, and only because she supports your cause. Uh, all right. Music, I say. Music! Before I go nuts here. All right, we have here another Chloe request for non-blondes. Yeah, <laughs> that there was a Hans Dietrich request, Rammstein with Du Hast. Uh, before that was them uh, doing uh, Gloria live in France. And we kicked it off with a four non-blonde singing, What's up? What's up? <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Well... I don't know what's up. I was trying to think about what's up, and 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 and, and I just, I just, I just, uh, it didn't occur to me what it what that might be. So it is what it is. Hey, All right. <laughs> darn thing! It's always trying to start on me. I, I I wish there was a better a better way to to stop uh, stop those things, but. Oh, yeah, there's not. All right. So I got that. 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 Pay no attention to me. What the fuck is going on? Exactly. 
Meester Brow. <sighs> Hansel says, or Judge Dredd, if you prefer that, one man's theology is another man's belly laugh. A quote by Robert Heinlein. Okay. If you say so. <laughs> All right, where am I here? I got, I got, I got more stories lined up here. Oh, let's talk about Venezuela and the nonsense going on down there. This was from yesterday. Electrical system mostly restored in Venezuela, but infrastructure, quote, accidents, unquote, continue. After nearly a week without electricity, almost 100% of power has been uh, restored in Venezuela, according to the Venezuelan Information Man Minister, Jorge Rodriguez, on Telesur. Venezuela would resume work activities on March 14th. However, all of the problems have not been solved. Problems remain with transformers that have been sabotaged, as in Baruta and El Hatilo on Sunday. Hatilo? Hatilo. Uh, the service has been restored in 60% of those areas. Rodriguez explained, adding the school activities are suspended for another 24 hours until today. The restoration of drinking water has also been restored up to 80%, with Caracas uh, sitting at 70% as of the late hours of March 13th. In the areas of water that water service has not yet been restored, there are water tankers delivering fresh and clean water to those in need. Despite the success of the Maduro government... Huh? Success of his... <laughs> what? How did I miss that with through with my first read? I don't know. <laughs> but despite the success of the Maduro government, accidents on the Venezuelan infrastructure continue in the country, or sabotage, as the case may be. In the late hours of March 13th, oil storage tanks exploded at Petro San Felix, a heavy crude upgrading project in eastern Venezuela. The country's main oil terminal resumed shipments after a prolonged blackout. The tanks of at the Petro San Felix project were holding dilutant, diluent, I don't know what that word is, which is mixed with extra heavy Arinco belt heavy crude to make it lighter. Uh, Venezuelan state oil company, President Manuel Cuevavedo, accused Marco Rubio, accused Marco Rubio of ordering more violence in Venezuela on his personal Twitter. Do they have a quote? They, they, have, they don't have that tweet listed here? Um, no, they don't. So a lot of this is just sabotage coming from the U.S. Uh, and, and other Zionist countries. I mean, um, <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. I'm pretty sure that's what I mean. Zionist countries. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's just more of the same stuff going on down there at this point in time. Uh, that we've seen in so many other countries where the United States goes in and creates chaos and, and pandemonium and and uh, hate and discontent and all kinds of other such things so that they can take over and inst instert their puppet. And they already have their puppet. It's this guy named Guido. Uh, I know that's not how you say his name, but that's how I say his name. How about this? How about this? Trump fans? <laughs> United States Senate passes Yemen war resolution, refusing to back Trump's support for the Saudi-led coalition. However, I'll get there in a second. The Republican-controlled Senate has passed a resolution that would end U.S. involvement in the Saudi-led coalition. Brutal war in Yemen? No, it's a it's a genocide in Yemen. It's not a war in Yemen. Yemen can't fight back. Countering President Trump's support for the controversial conflict. Uh, the Yemen War Powers Resolution, which was passed 54 to 46, blocks U.S. forces from any involvement in the increasingly unpopular genocide without further authorization from Congress. Its backers have argued that the United States' involvement in the conflict violates the constitutional requirement 
that Congress alone can authorize participation in a war. Again, not a war, a genocide. Uh, an earlier version of the resolution passed the Democrat-controlled House <coughs> of Representatives, but was rejected by the Senate. The resolution must now pass the House again before it is sent to the White House, where Trump has promised to veto it. So I guess he's got that veto thing hot and heavy at this point in time. Uh, he, he's obviously, I think he already vetoed the uh, uh, the, the border thing where, where they said, we're not going to support your wall. And he was just like, go to hell. Do what I want. Uh, kind, of, kind of the same deal here. So, fuck him. The hell does this guy think he's up to? Supporting genocide. Ah. <laughs> oh, man. I don't know. <laughs> All right, let's 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 wrap it up on this one. Kind of a lighthearted and uh, more fun fun story. Um, I guess. I, I mean, good for this guy from the Daily Caller by Joshua Gill, who's apparently a religion reporter. Not sure what that is means, but there it is. Man gives up all food and drinks for Lent. Will only drink beer. <laughs> An Ohio man is fasting from food for Lent and will drink only beer until Easter Sunday. Like a 17th century German monk. Del Hall, an employee of 50 West Brewing Company, said that, that though he has done a four-day water fast, distinguished himself in the army and run a marathon the challenge of consuming only beer and water for the 46 days seems daunting to him Hall took his cue for the fast from German monks of the 1600s who during the Christian liturgical season of Lent consumed only a certain style of relatively nutritious beer until Easter uh, being brew master brewers they decided they would take a popular style of beer in Germany, Bach beer, make it extra hearty, and that would be their their liquid bread, and that's what they call it. Hall said, according to uh, Idaho News, so monks in Bavaria, they would call Doppelbach liquid bread, and basically it would sustain them through the 46 days of Lent. He will document his Lent beer diet on social media, where he will document how he feels, how his weight changes through the fast. I'm an Army veteran. I was number one in my class of the Army. I've run several or a full marathon before, 26.2 miles. I've done big challenges, and this seems very daunting, he said. So I'm just curious if I'm up to the challenge, if I'm going to be able to do it or not. <laughs> oh, buddy, you are going to be fucking blitzed. You are going to be fucking toasted <laughs> for, the, for the next 46 days there. <laughs> oh, man. All right, we got to run our final set here. <laughs> All right, I have no idea what this first song is. It is a Rome's Request, and it's by a band I am not familiar with. So um, I, here you go. It's called Parquet Courts. The song is called Wide Awake. Enjoy. <laughs> Black Betty. Christopher Amoroso with his version of Black Betty there. Uh, before that, we had Barry McGuire and Eve of Destruction. We kicked it off with uh, the Rome's Request, Parquet Courts, and Wide Awake. And I don't know what that was exactly, but uh, thanks, Rome's. <laughs> All right, uh, that's going to wrap it up here for me this evening. I uh, hope you all enjoyed the music and the stories and the chat, if you're in the chat room there, and everything else. I'll be back next Friday, hopefully, with the Moose Girl. We'll find out, you know, she... Uh, she, she's never sure about her schedule till the end, so... But this week she was, so that's good. Um, 
I guess that's all. Have, a, have yourselves a great weekend and a great next week. Peace.